Good morning. How many of you really believe that last song? Can you guys remember when you gave your hearts to the Lord? Was that a happy day? The day He washed your sins away? Isn't that something to be incredibly thankful for? We are so blessed. Sometimes we sing it and we don't understand until we actually reflect later on and go, wow, what a day that was. What a day it continues to be as we continually fall short, but God saves us. He forgives us. I just have a couple things that I want to look at in the, in the bulletin. Um, Adam has an announcement, so are you still here? Good. We're going to leave him here. Look at the opening verse. It says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And I'm thinking, is that not an awesome word for the family of God? That's what family does, folks. We carry each other's burdens. And not just our own family, but it's also the people around us, those. And so many of you are already doing that. And we actually talked about that today in our sharing time at Praise and Worship and, um, at the prayer time here, how different people do stuff. They go out of their way just to be a blessing to others. And that's what we're called to do as believers. It's incredible. I just want to bring your attention to the families of the week. Uh, Larry and Marlene Hebert, Dan and Nancy Hildebrandt. Uh, the ministry of the week is the senior youth, and the church of the week is the Graceway Church. Let's just pray for them right now, and then I just also want to bring your attention, before we pray to the, the praise and prayer, it says to pray for the Voss family as they mourn the loss of Vim's sister. Also pray for Jasper and Elkia as they are in Africa. Pray for Amber Fraze as she is still in the hospital. Pray for wisdom for the doctors and answers from the tests. So let's just do that right now. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you that we as a body have the privilege of coming here to worship you this morning. I thank you that we have the privilege of coming here to hear from you, Lord. I just want to pray for, for Pastor Jim as he comes up here, God, that as you use him as your instrument, I want to pray that his words would fall in fertile soil this morning. God, would we be receptive to hear? And God, as we lift up our voices and sing as we praise, Lord, I pray you would remind us of that happy day. God, when you washed our sins away, what an incredible thing to focus on. The price that you paid for that. But Lord, we want to thank you now for our families of the week. We want to thank you for our ministry of the week. Lord, we just pray a blessing on all the churches, and specifically this morning we, we pray for the Grace Way as they're, they're searching for a pastor, Lord, to lead that flock. I want to pray, Lord, that they would just sense your direction and you would lead them. And Lord, as, as the Voss family is in our prayers this morning, I just want to pray for protection. I want to pray, Lord, for comfort for the Vosses, um, for the whole family surrounding um, the loss that occurred there. I just pray, God, that your arms would be around the Voss family this morning. You give them words um, to minister to each other and just uh, encourage them, God, by your word. And I pray we would continue to remember to lift them up to you. And, and Lord, I, just, I can't imagine... Uh, the phrase family, what they're going through, I just want to pray, Lord, that you would just be there for them as well. Lord, continue to, to uh, be near them, to comfort them. I pray, God, for a miracle there. I pray, Lord, she would be healed in Jesus' name. That's what you came to do, Lord. You came to heal us. So I pray, Lord, you would heal her in whatever means possible. Thank you, God, again for what you're going to do. We just want to lift your name, God. We want to give all the glory to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Adam, if you would come. Okay, Kev, you can come on up already. Um, so a couple of things, I'm going to keep it short. Um, next week, Monday, I want you guys to mark your calendars. March 7th is the Smitty's Wing Night um, fundraiser that we're having. It's 20 bucks a ticket. You cannot get tickets at the door. You need to get tickets from us because we have them. So um, you can talk to, you know what? Okay, anyone that is going to Haiti in three and a half weeks, I want you to stand up. I'm not going to get you to come up here today, but anyone that's going to Haiti in the next in three and a half weeks, stand up. Okay, so everybody look around. These are the people that have tickets. These are also the people that are giving up their spring break and sacrificing time and money to go and help what the pastors in Grand Guave, Haiti are doing. So you guys can give them a round of applause. Because that's pretty awesome. All right. Second thing I want to say is you've no, you'll notice that there are no longer, or maybe you won't notice because you didn't go to the bathroom this morning, that there are no longer envelopes down the hall. Now, the envelope, um, I called it the, um, what did I call it? 
I had a slogan, anyways, that was pretty catchy that I forgot. Apparently, it wasn't that catchy. Um, and uh, basically, if we would have filled all of those envelopes, um, that would have taken care of all of the in-country costs that both the youth and college and career needed to raise. Anyway, so they weren't moving, so we're like, man, how do we get these envelopes moving? Um, do we have them out here? Kevin's going to do it? Okay. Um, so then I will not take away Kevin's thunder. Um, but they will, there will also be, he's going to talk a little bit about these ten, um, but there will also be a box beside the coffee. And as you're getting your coffee, you can pick one at random and commit to filling it. Now, whether that's you going to the patio, because I know that everybody here goes to the patio for coffee. Um, if that's you going to the patio and saying, hey, my youth group is going on a mission trip, would you, would you give a donation? Um, that'd be awesome. That'd be really cool if our whole church could get into the community and help us raise support, because we have a long way to go and three and a half weeks to get there. So here is Kevin. Awesome. Okay. Um, I was told to come up here and say why I'm going on this uh, missions trip. And I'm also going to warn you all against praying. Because I've been doing a lot of praying. And he answers. So this is just a warning. I, uh, part of the reason I wanted to go, well, part of the reason was Buran was supposed to go. But I got her pregnant and now she can't go. So I tried to make every excuse. For yeah, I tried to make all sorts of excuses for not being able to go. Like I had, uh, I was working for a different company. They wouldn't give me holidays. I didn't think, but now I'm, I'm done with them in a week, so I can't use that excuse. And uh, yeah, I had a whole bunch. I'm not going to bother going through them all. But one of the main reasons I wanted to go was I have, uh, I got a, a couple friends out that live out here that I can, I just don't have the guts to share, to, sh to share the gospel with them. I'm just too scared. I'm out of my comfort zone. And uh, so I've just been praying that, like, this trip will be, you know, get me out of my comfort zone, so I'll get used to being out of my comfort zone. And I've just really been praying that God would give me a chance to uh, get more courage. And since I've started to pray that, I've actually been up here twice, which is really out of my comfort zone. So I get, like, you probably can't notice, but I shake a lot when I'm up here, and it's, it's terrible. But anyway, so if you are going to pray, God will answer. And the way he's getting me to be more vocal and out there is going on this trip. And we also have, uh, we have an amazing group that we are going with. I'm with the College and Career. And, and we just have an awesome group that, that we're going with. So I'm really looking forward to that. Now, to get me further out of my comfort zone, I was told that I have 10 envelopes here. They range a wide, like I got $17.00 all the way up to a lot more than $17. So I only have 10 envelopes. I am hoping that I can get 10 people up here to randomly pick one and just commit to to paying whatever that envelope is. And I was told I need to get 10 people before I can leave. So I am really hoping I can get somebody up here. They have prizes in them. I, no, don't, don't show them what it is. Some of them have prizes. I was told they can be anything from a gift card at the patio to an hour massage. Right? That is right? An hour massage? He's not confirming that, but I'm really hoping that's right. And if there's, if we only end up with one, our college and career will pay one. Are we out? Oh, you guys are awesome. Thank you. I'm out of here. Adam, don't run away. I got a problem that we got to deal with yet here. You know, a couple weeks ago I said that you should all go to the bake sale and get something, and it turned out that I had to go someplace else, and I couldn't go to the bake sale. So this is a deposit, okay, on a, a, a tray about this big of Rice Krispie squares. All right. Okay, I couldn't get there Friday because something else came up, and I didn't forget about it. 
So I'm going to make this as a deposit, but right. those Rice Krispie squares better show up or this is going to bounce higher than the roof. Okay. <laughs> I'll put my best chef on it, my best baker. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you don't, want to, you don't want to get a whole bunch of college and career people mad at you when you promise to do something. Did some of you go and buy some pastry and you just spend over $100 for it? We waited for you all day. We had a <laughs> That's why I said that's a down payment. Please listen to my English carefully. <laughs> my doctor said I shouldn't be eating fattening stuff, but anyway, but we haven't forgot about you, and keep praying for the youth, and uh, anytime, where'd Adam go? If it's sometime through the week that in the next couple of weeks you're, you have a college and career meeting and you would like us, to, uh, me and Cohen, just to come over and pray with you. Uh, for a little bit that evening before you go out or encourage you somehow, give you all a big hug, love to come to that too. Okay, so just let me know. I, uh, huh? Wednesday. This coming Wednesday? Now you got to fight Ed for that one. We'll work it out. I see Rice Krispie Squares are going to get pretty good here. Maybe, maybe I can start doing a fundraiser for Project Lambs. I like that idea of Brett coming up front with all kinds of envelopes. I'm going to have to try that sometime. You're not leaving the church service until we get rid of all these envelopes. No, I mean, that would be neat. You know, I'm a lot bigger than those guys, so you couldn't get by me. But are you happy today, praising the Lord? I got a, a little bit of slides I want to show you, just kind of as an introduction, if we can make it work. Uh, it's been a challenging week in the country of, of Myanmar, and especially with Cohen's catching people again. And uh, can, is it going to work for us today? Put the first one up. Good. Some of you remember Samson that was here. Uh, over the last couple, a week or so, the church there has decided to do something really radical. They're fed up with the drugs and their young people. And so they're going out into the mountains and into the fields and into the highways and byways with their machetes, and they're cutting down all the opium they can find. And so far, 10,000 Christians have raised up. That's a lot of people. And, uh, but unfortunately, this week, as they were beginning to go out some more, they were being threatened. And uh, this is Dr. Samson. If you can go to the next slide. I don't want to take a long time here, but next slide. This is what they're trying to destroy. Opium is made from that white gooey stuff on the side. And so just before it flowers, they, they slice it and, and uh, scoop off that white stuff, and out of that becomes opium. And the government is using that opium, and uh, other militaries are using that to get the young people hooked so that they will become destroyed. And that's happening. Like the, the, the drug problem in, in amongst the catch-in right now, youth is... Is just terrible. And so this is where it all comes from. The next one. And so these are the Christians gathering together that go out and to destroy these opium fields. And, uh, and so this, uh, there's three areas, about three, three to 4,000 people every area that have gathered together. They have to go out into these mountains areas and uh, take a stand. Can you imagine if we did that in Canada, take a stand against drugs? And just go after all the... You know what they do? Can you imagine? They find out who anyone who's selling drugs in their church, the, the pastors and leadership, um, take them down to the police station and turn them in. That, that wouldn't make a lot of Christians happy, would that? But it's so bad, and so many young people are being killed, that they have to do something. And so the church is rising up and saying, we're not going to stand for this anymore, this whole drug scene. And so go to the next slide. And so you can see again, look at them all. Look at them all going up into the mountains. But the sad thing that began to happen this week, that the drug people and uh, some of the military people have, have decided that they were going to start shooting and killing the Christians. So what happened, uh, the, this was very moving. Go to the next slide. The pastors all showed up, and they stood in the front, and they said to the armies, and they said to the, to the drug dealers, if you're going to kill, kill us first. And they stood as a wall, these pastors, 
Catholic pastors, they started to lift up their hands. Probably all these guys with those purple hats on are mainly pastors and ministers and stood before the armies and said, kill us, but we will not stop. Can you imagine that? That, that is unbelievable. And the next picture, show that one, if you can. Going once, going twice, gone. Will it go to the next picture? No? Okay, there was a next picture that showed uh, a number of these men, like the gentleman right here that's got something in his hand. Uh, he, he, is, he was one of my brothers that helped me to get married to Colwyn. This one on this end with the red cross, I believe, was Colwyn's uncle. And uh, he's the evangelist. And so these, these are all people we know, like Samson and all that, that are saying, if you're going to do it, do it to us. We're ready to go. But these people on drugs are not ready to meet Jesus. We are. They're not. So you've got to do it. And so what happened? It won't go to any more slides at all. So what happened in one area this week, I think it was on Tuesday or Wednesday, it, it really shook up Colwyn and I. Uh, the, some of the people started throwing bombs into the trucks and stuff. Yeah, these are, these are my pastor brothers and that. Oh, I should just quickly tell you, see this guy here in the middle? He died one time and he was dead for over seven hours and then God raised him from the dead. If you've never met one, you know, there's one right there. Reverend Samson is over on this side. See the guy with the blue-gray? Okay, next one. And so they started throwing bombs into the crowds and into the trucks. And now all, many of the hospitals are full of, of Christians who have been shot or bombed. And we need to pray for them. Next one. And here's the hospital full of casualties. Uh just for taking a stand for Christ, wanting to, to cut down the poppies. And now the hospitals are, are full of people, but they have not got discouraged. They know that they need to do this. Next one. And so I put up here, here's the enemy. This is, you know, we, we need to pray. God puts people in place and he takes people out of place, right? And so this is the top general uh, in the middle there. This is the president of the country, the guy with the suit. Right now, An Chan Su Chi will become president at the end of this, in the March. You can see the military there with their guns, the police with their guns. And, you know, it's, it's a real life and death battle. We don't face those kinds of things in Canada yet, but it may come to that. Next picture. And so you can see the people, they, own, they know that the only hope that they have is in Jesus Christ. And there, can you imagine all these people out there saying, yes, we're going to call upon the name of our God because we can't do nothing, but he can. So let's just turn that off and have a word of prayer for them right now. Can we do that? Amen. Father, we want to pray. Um, I want to pray especially right now for the Ketchin people, Lord, that you would just really be with them in their churches and in their stand against this drug that's killing so many of the young people in that. And I pray, O oh God, that you will just be with Samson and the ministers and the pastors as they have put themselves up as a wall, Lord, that uh, where they've said, this is where we stand and we will not be moved. And Lord, I thank you for their dedication in their Christian faith. And Lord, I just pray that you would be mighty with them today and that you would strengthen them through this week. And Lord, that you would just... Uh, that the enemy wouldn't make this an opportunity to bring in the heavy artillery and the airplanes and that to, to, to wipe out thousands of people. Lord, you know that the potential that is there, and Lord, we've been praying about that. And I want to also just take a moment, maybe it's a little selfish, Lord, but I want to pray for Colwyn, Lord, and for myself. These are our friends, Lord. These are our family members, Lord. These are people that we have worked with for many years and are Lord, sometimes our heart is overwhelmed, and we pray for our hearts this week too, Lord, that you would help us as we pray, Lord, for them. But, Lord, you know in many ways Colwyn and I want to be there standing in the front line. Lord, enough is enough, Lord, that they've gone through enough persecutions and enough trials and enough heartaches. But, Lord, we're asking that you would then raise up a standard like never before. 
And Lord, that you would stand in the gap for them. And so we're agreeing together as a church right now for the Ketchin people and for the Ketchin Christians. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So continue to remember them if you can. Uh, I'm just going to sit this here because last week I, or two weeks ago I told you about it. There's some now on the back if you're, if you're still interested. Amen. I heard that. And, uh, you know, what we want to talk about today is, I believe, so important. You know, last weekend uh, I turned on the, the, uh, the race, that 500-mile race. What is it called? ND 500. And my son-in-law is, he works for a company in the city that they do some computerized thing while this ND 500 is on so that the people who are listening could tune in with their computer games and have upfront action and everything. And he's all excited about it. So my wife, Cohen had never heard about this, uh, this race. And um, uh, NASCAR, right? Yeah. And so... I thought I would turn it on for her in a few minutes. And she watched it, and she says, what's the purpose of that race? And why are so many people there? And I said, well, they just go around and around in circles. Really, all those people sit there and watch other people just go around and around in circles. Yeah, and they pay a lot of money to it. So what is the purpose of it? Well, so that people can watch them go around and around in circles. But the neat part of it is when they smash up. That's when everybody gets excited. Oh, so she asked me, when do they smash up? And I said, well, you have to wait. You know, somebody will make a mistake or do something, and they will smash up, and everybody will, will be sad and, and happy and everything else because they got their money's worth. So I'm just, she's, she's listening to all this and said, and you guys, she's kind of thinking, I can see it in her mind, you guys are in a free country. You, you, have, you have so much education and so much wisdom and you go and you spend hundreds of dollars at a racetrack so you can watch people go round and round in circles. And I said, well, yeah, I guess that's what you know, North Americans are all about. And we do this every month. We have another race coming up in the Indy 500, and they just keep going around and around in circles. She said, that's really boring. So you lost a fan there. But, and then I, I come up with a smart remark, because you know, that's what husbands are for, is to come up with smart remarks. And I said to her, well, in your country, you always go around and around in circles. You never do anything in a straight line. And I guess now that you're living here, now we're going around circles and circles. She understands. That's why she's smiling right now. But I want to go to a passage of scriptures, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, because it also talks about a race. If one of the things that you, you, have, you might learn about me, I'm going back to the, a lot of the scriptures we know. Because I found out that as I've been preaching around the world, that as I go back and preach on some of these scriptures that many of us have memorized, I have found out many of us don't know them or understand them. We, we know them off by heart. You know, we, we can even quote them. But until they actually change our lives, then we really don't understand them. Uh, D.L. Moody said one time to a, a pastor that he had invited to come and preach at his church, at the great uh, cathedral down there in uh, Chicago. And the guy got up the first night, the young man, and he, and he preached on John 3.16. And just a tremendous result. And then the next night he got up and he preached on John 3.16. And finally, D.L. Moody was wondering, so what are you going to preach on the next night? And he says, John 3.16. And, and Moody kind of said to him, well, how many times are you going to preach on it? He says, I'm going to preach on it and preach on it and preach on it until I've seen that they've changed. Otherwise, they haven't got it yet. Now, I don't always do that, but I do preach on some sermons several times because God uses them and anoints them to touch people's lives. And sometimes we can hear something over and over again, but don't really hear it. It's like, it's like young people can tell you when they, when they talk to their moms and dads, there's a certain age where moms and dads don't hear anymore. You ever notice that? We get selective in our hearing. you know. And then there's husbands get selective in their hearing to their wives, and wives get selective in their hearing to husbands. 
and and they talk to each other and they have no clue what each other has just said. Cohen will say to me, what do you think? And I'll say, think about what? That which I just talked to you about. Oh, you said something? Does anyone have a husband like that? One, one and a half? Okay, now. Yeah. Okay, so you know, anyone have a wife like that? Oh, yeah, no, no, guys are really going to put their both hands. <laughs> we got you. You're not going to get out of this one. Well, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, is one of those familiar verses that sometimes you'll even see up at the front of the church, and it will sit up there for years or so. And let's just say it. it says, therefore, chapter 12, verse 1, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and that the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now we know that verse but sometimes the context of that verse can kind of change things a lot. And the context of that verse is chapter 11 of Hebrews, which we call the, the Hall of Fame of Faith, where Paul gives a description through the whole chapter 11 what happened to believers. Some believers, everything they touched, they were blessed. <laughs> and other believers, everything they touched went wrong. And if I was to take a survey in here, there's a lot of you who are blessed. And you could stand up and give testimony and say, I'm blessed of God. God has blessed me and blessed me and blessed me. And then there would be other people looking at you kind of strange-like and saying, well, that's, I don't seem to serve the same God because everything I touch goes wrong. Everything I say goes wrong. Every time I try to get a new job, it goes wrong. Every time I try to deal with the bank, it goes wrong. And you will have those two groups in the midst of even this congregation. Some who will be, seems like, as I said, everything they touch turns to gold, and another group, everything they touch goes wrong. Do you know what I'm talking about? And this is what happens in the times of Hebrews chapter 11, when Paul was trying to show them and tried to get them to understand that faith is more than just the things here on earth, but faith is in faith, having faith in God, Jesus Christ Almighty. Now, the key word to our Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 1 and 2 here, I think I wrote down as the key word, is that word, let us. Because it's a word that we use a lot, but it's not sometimes have any meaning. And it's used twice in the first verse. Let us. Let us. See, when you talk about the catch in people, it's, it's nice to say, well, you pastors go do it. You people go do it. But in reality, what God is asking us is let us do it. Amen? It's something that we have to do. We can't, we can't say to Jesus, well, Jesus, you go do it. Jesus will say to us, well, I want to do it, but I want to do it through you, and you're going to have to ask me to let me do it through you. Let us. The world would be changed if we would just do the part of let us. See, there's an action that has to come in part of our lives that we have to do. And we're not just supposed to be like in that 500 Nassau race where everybody just sits around and watches. But there's some of us, some of those people had to be the let us, those who are actually going to run the race. There's always going to be a lot of spectators. The scriptures tells us even here that there's a great... A um, crowd of witnesses in heaven watching. But what are they watching for? They're watching for us to do something. Amen? Who got quiet. Cohen, help me out. Can you say amen? Good. I was, I was getting her practice this morning. She's so quiet, you have to listen carefully. But we're coming into an age where we can't expect others to do it but that we ourselves are going to have to do it. Well, we're going to have to take a stand, and we're going to have to say, like those pastors, let us stand in front of our congregation, and let us be shot first if need be. 
Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? I'm hoping that it doesn't have to get to that place in your own personal lives. But it may. As a missionary, I've had to say over and over again to the Lord, Lord, I'm, we're ready to die. The only request that we have, Cohen and I, is that we die together. That's a strange request, isn't it? But, you know, we thought, well, we want to do it together. Whatever we're going to do. So let us go together. Let us run the race. And so this key word, let us, we're going to use four times today just to bring to light this passage of Scripture. The first point that we need to understand is that let us lay aside every weight. Now this idea of weight here is usually more uh, drawn together with earthly things. When I first married Call Wynn and she moved into our house, she was polite, but she said to me, you've got a lot of stuff. Now, stuff means a variety of definitions between junk, garbage, and why do you got the stuff? Okay? And she walked around and sometimes in our house and said, does any of this have any purpose or reason? And I had to say, well, it all has purpose or reason or I wouldn't have it. So what do you do with it? Well, it just sits there until I'm ready to do something with it. And when will that be? I don't know. It's just it's important to keep. So I have boxes of nails and boxes of screws and boxes. And so every once in a while when I fix something in the house, I remind her, remember that stuff you said was no good? See, I just used it and I can smile. But the problem is a lot of us got a lot of stuff Things that are weighting us down. Things that are keeping us from going forward. I, I've seen the church, one pastor said to me years ago, the more stuff you got, the more time you're going to have to take to maintain that stuff. Because it will break down. And so the problem is that Paul was trying to say here, let us lay aside every weight. And sometimes there's things that you have to, we don't realize are weights. Like sometimes a weight could be a young person with their cell phone. Oh, oh, I better buy it now because some of them. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. That was uh, they paid me 20 bucks to say that. <laughs> or it could be your tablet, or it could be your computer, or it could be something that has, even though it's not negative. It can even be positive, but a positive thing can create weight upon you. Can you bring me that bottle of water there, please? Do you understand what I'm saying? There's things, thanks, Cohen. In case you're wondering, this is my wife, Cohen. <laughs> that there's things that so easily weigh us down. And as I say, they're not necessarily sinful, but they keep us from what God really wants to do through our lives. That's the problem. Christians are the best at making excuses. Did you know that? Excuses for why not getting involved, why not doing this, why not doing that. I'm, I'm a professional one at that too. But in reality, God doesn't want us to be in, entangled with the weights of this world. He wants us to be entangled or tied up or bound together with him. Moses tells us in Deuteronomy that we have a free choice. Choose life or choose death, Deuteronomy chapter 30 says. We can make a choice. It's a free choice. The more I read the Bible, I can boil it down to one question. What will you choose to do? Live for God? Or live for the world. If you live for the world, it will weight you down. Sometimes we we keep enough stuff behind so that we can, and we, we try to keep enough money and keep enough everything so that when we die, we can pass it all on to the next generation and weigh them down too. Did you know that? When my dad died, he was a professional stuff keeper-upper. That's bad English, but that's the way I talk, okay? 
I had to bring in a, almost a semi-truck size dumpster. And for a long time, my wife and I chucked things out the window and chucked, because these were all things that one day. And so now his stuff, which had entangled him and weighed him down, was now entangling me and weighing me down. I even brought some of that stuff home. I rented a U-Haul trailer and drove from Ontario bringing back all these earthly treasures. And I still have some of them in the house. But I have last couple years ago, I bought a Ford pickup and it knows how to drive to the city dump. And I can fill it up and fill it up. And you may be, may be amazed, but I probably have taken 20 loads of valuable things to the dump. Why? Because they were weighing me down. Or the self-help. And maybe some of you went there and then took it to your house. So if I go to your house for lunch or something and I see some of my stuff in your house, I'm not going to say a word. Bless you, my son and daughter. But the Bible is very clear here. Let us deal with the weights. Sometimes it's easier to come forward and just pray instead of saying, Lord, I can see this is a weight. What do I do with it? And you know what he's going to say? Get rid of it. It's a weight. It's causing you a wall between you and me. Amen? Have any of you got stuff like that? As I say, it's not sinful. I'm not trying to say it's sinful, but what it does is it becomes like a wall between you and God, and it weighs you down. So Paul says, let us lay aside every, every, every weight, and whatever it may be that is entangling us, we've got to let it go. The second one is, let us lay aside sin. If there's a problem in the North America church right now, is we don't like let it, setting aside sin. We'd rather set aside all kinds of other things. But those particular little things, we don't want to get rid of. And, but again, it's something we need to do. We'll pray, oh God, God help me to, to set it aside. Yes, he will help you, but somewhere along the line, you've got to grab the bottle. Somewhere along the line, you've got to grab whatever it is that's, that is sin. And you know what it is. I don't have to tell you. You know what I found out years ago? Everybody knows where they're sinning. Amen? You, the Holy Spirit, He's really great at doing that. But whether we will then take what the Holy Spirit tells us and lay it aside. And so often, this we need to lay aside what? Those spiritual things that are attacking our heart. Because sin itself attacks our hearts. And do you know what sin is, young people? Here's the definition of sin. <laughs> Being disobedient. That's it. If you go to some scriptures, it even lists, it lists, it lists that for us where it says, it will list all kinds of things, and then with one word it says, being disobedient to parents. You know what? The Bible says that's a sin. All kinds of things that go against God is sinful. There is no halfway sin, no three quarter sin. It's either sin or not sin. Amen? But now he says to us, let us lay aside sin. See, when we begin to lay aside sin and begin to be obedient, we will have revival. People pray for, say to me, we're praying for revival. We'll pray for revival. It will never happen. I'm sorry. It will never happen in North America. Why? Because we're not willing to lay aside the weights and we're not willing to lay aside the sin. I got my hand up too, okay? I'm struggling about certain things that I know I should lay aside, but they're nice. You know? I'm trying to work at, you know one of the things I'm trying to work at the last little while? I have this thing called a remote, and I've discovered it has an on and off button on it. And you push it, and the TV goes off, and you push it, and the TV goes on. I'm trying to learn asking God for help. But he said, let us, together, me and him, push the little red button 
so it turns off. And you know what I found? I have more time to study the Word of God, more time to write, more time to praise Him, because together we were able to push the little bit of button. Why? That was, so, was such a weight, and I could justify it. Well, I need to know the world news. I need to know about this program. I need, I need, I need. And, you know, I worked hard all day long, and this is the only thing I do. I don't go drink, smoke, party, or anything else. The only thing I do, I mean, yeah, yeah, I've been there. Right? Are you there? But it says, let us get rid of those things which can be sinful. The things that we have turned our life away from God. And these sinful things can bring us into captivity. Look what happened to Adam and Eve. Thirdly, he talks about, let us then run with endurance. The whole idea of, of our walk here is, is, a, is a marathon. Unfortunately, I have, I have met Christians. I guess the, the thing about being in Steinbach area for now since 1980, well, I shouldn't say since 19, I did live in Grunthal here for a little while. I needed to be learned some things about different people, and so I lived here for three years in Grunthal, and then after that I couldn't handle anymore. Then I moved to Steinbach. I couldn't handle Steinbach anymore. I didn't want to live in the brokery because I couldn't speak French, so I ended up in Marchand. Okay, that's where all the people who are rejected end up go to. Okay. Anyone live in Marshan? I did that last week, and one lady put up her hand, and I said, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> but it's a race that we need to endure. It's something, the sad part of it, as I, as I run to, as, or as I'm involved in my race, I meet people at Canadian Tire, I meet people at a different place. Where are you fellowshipping now? Well, I'm not anymore. Where, where are you having Bible study? I'm not anymore. Where are you spending time in praying? Because we, we used to have a big church at Full Gospel Chapel, so I know a lot of people. And uh, some of you are here. <laughs> I'm still praying for you. I know I messed you up a long time ago, and I'm trying to undo all that. But there's a lot of people that have just given up. They're like the seeds that were that Jesus tells about where there was the four kinds of soils. And some were like the soil where they just sprang up quickly and, and because of the lack of, of water died and some were on the pathway and some would end up in the weeds. And, and, and I'm seeing a lot of that in Steinbach now. See, when you don't live in an area for a long time, you don't notice those kinds of things because as you move from place to place, you won't know it. But I've been here for a long time, and I see a lot of people that have, that have been crushed on the pathway, that have fallen into the weeds, that have been, you know, planted on dry ground. But praise the Lord, there's still others, though, who have gone into good soil and are growing. So the thing we have to ask ourselves is that we, are we willing to participate in such a way that we will keep running with endurance? And we keep our eyes on the end results. That we stun, that Isaiah 40 says, that we run and we do not become weary. Some of you came up to me last time I was here and said, man, you just seem like you're, you're so healthy and you're so strong. I mean, we travel all over the place. I'm not always healthy and strong. But I've learned to run the race with endurance, to pace myself. Can I tell you a little secret? Before I come and preach here on Sundays, I make sure on Saturday I sleep about half the day. I just want to quiet and write down. I just want to rest. So if I'm preaching here over the next few weeks or next few months, which I am, don't call me Saturday afternoon. Because I'm just wanting to get myself calmed down so I can run the race today with endurance with endurance. Not because of who I am, but because of who he is. Fourthly, it goes on and says, but let us finish the race set before us. As I said, one of the most saddest things that I see nowadays is that people give up on the race and don't run anymore. Well, I've been a missionary, been there, done that. I've been a Sunday school teacher, been there, done that. 
I've been a deacon, I've been there, done that. I've been an usher there and been there, done that. Is I hear this been there, done that thing. Well, I've preached for 40 years and I've been there and I'm still doing it. It's not a been there, done that, but let us run with endurance. Why? Why do we want to run with endurance? Because we want to be able to finish the race well. I want to finish the race with my running outfit still on. I want to have my shoes on. I want to have my whatever it is that you wear for running. I want, to, I want to keep running. The best way I want to die is that I'm moving along. If I was to die right now here of a heart attack, two things you need to understand. Don't resuscitate me, because if you do, I'll kill you. Because <laughs> I want to go to heaven as quickly as possible. Okay? But on the other hand, I need to be wise. God healed me a number of years ago, and he said, I'm going to heal you, but I want you to be wise. Because there's a running of the race that we need to run with endurance, but we need to run in such a way that our eyes are set and are focused on finishing the race. We're in a race that's going to last our whole lives. Too many young people start off the race well. And then they have this kind of 30, 40 year span where they just do their own thing and we don't see them for a while. And then eventually as they get older, all of a sudden they start thinking about spiritual things because maybe someday they think about they're going to die, so we better get things straightened up. But that's not the idea of the race here. The idea of the race is to be consistently going in the Word of God the whole journey. I want to be able to stand up that when I say to my pastor at the age of seven, or to my Lord, at the age of 17, I started the race and I have never stopped. Oh, I've had mountains. I've had valleys. See, I used to be a marathon runner. And I know what running up and down hills and all those, <laughs> you laugh now, you say, oh, you've been a marathon runner. Ah, that's a long story. <laughs> Read about it in the book when I finish it. But I used to. And I had to learn how to pace my breathing, pace my running, pace everything. But as I did it, I was able to complete long races. And Christ tells us in John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that if we continue on running with him, he is there ready to reward us. But we need to be focused on finishing the race. So let us lay aside every weight. Let us lay aside sin. Let us run with endurance. Let us finish the race set before us. And in the second verse, he tells us why. And he tells us how. How do we do these first four points then? How can we get this into our lives? And he tells us very clearly, let us look unto Jesus. Let us look unto Jesus. The problem with many of us as disciples of Christ, Christ is the last thing we looked at. When we're finally in the pit, we're finally so far down, we, we finally messed up everything else, a little voice comes into our head one more time, because that's what grace is all about, and says, you know, are you ready to change this now? See, he won't force you into change. He'll talk to you, because he wants you to do it out of love. If he forces us into change, then it's not love. Do you understand what I'm saying? A lot of times, God doesn't do what he does, could do. I mean, if he did what we deserve to get, we'd all be dead right now. <laughs> that would be the truth, wouldn't it? But the thing is, God wants us to look unto him. Let us look. Let us take time to look. Look at the weights that are on us. Look at the sin that is entangling us. Look at whether we're really enduring or not. Look at, are we even in the race anymore, or have we stepped out of the race? See, the key word here is look. Look. Take time to look at yourself. Go and find, James says, go find a mirror and look in the mirror. And when you see what you see in the mirror, James says, just don't look at it, but do something about it. You know, I love you all. I mean, I hope you understand I always pray that I, uh, when I preach here that I'm not going to come across while well, he's always beating us. No, I'm not trying to beat at you or anything. I just want you to have what I have. 
I want you to have the joy that passes all understanding. I want you to have the peace of God running ruling in your life. I want you to have the fullness of God. And the only way you can have that is take my Jesus and let us together, him and me, let us get rid of the weights. Let us get rid of the sins. Let us run. He wants to run with you. And he's been running with me for a long time. He never outruns me. And he never really does anything that causes me to want to give up on him. But you know what I have to learn? I have to learn to focus on him. We must look to him. Why? Because he, the scriptures, verse 2 says, is the author and finisher. When it's all done, he's the final word. When Irene was dying of tremendous pain and sickness of cancer, and some of you know that, the nurses and doctors kept coming to me and saying, what is it with that woman? She is suffering so terribly, but she's still smiling and praising her Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because she knew that very soon she was going to be in heaven and walk on the streets of gold with Jesus Christ. And that's not suffering. Yes, for a short time we have pain and trials and tribulations here on earth, but one day it will be gone. One day it will be over. Why? Because the race will come to an end. Time will be no more. All suffering, sickness, and trials will be no more. Hallelujah! Amen? i got to get a hold of that guy. He's really good. And I believe he's saying it from his heart. That he's the author and finisher of our faith. He was able, through the dying of the cross, to make things right. And so we are called together. Music group, why don't you come on up? Worship team. So the key word today is, is the word let us. Amen? Now, I'm going to really bug you about something right now. You know what, you know what I want to bug you about? Remember I said the word let us? So that means if we're asking for Jesus to help us to do something together with him, he has already come before us and he's already speaking to us about doing something, about making some change, about the kind of race that we're running. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm just a, a, a speaker. And if it's not anointed by the Holy Spirit, it's just going to be empty words. But I believe... The Holy Spirit is anointing the words today and that he's speaking to you today and that all of you or some of you can put up to your hands and I want you to do this and say to me that God is speaking to you about something right now that he's asking you to deal with together with him. Where he's saying, let us. How many of you are experiencing right now that by the Holy Spirit? Put your hand up, put it down. Okay, that's a good half of you. The trick is now, or the question is, what are we going to do about it? That's the hardest question I face every day. What am I going to do about it? And it doesn't work by saying, I'll deal with it tomorrow. I will deal with it the next day. I will deal with it. No, today is the day. Today is the acceptable day. I don't know what it is that you're struggling with. But I know he's asking some of us to get untangled for some of the weights that we have put around us. Amen? How many of you is he saying that to? Did you need to get untangled? These are not sinful things, but just things you're tangled up in. Okay? Okay. How many of you is saying, you know, hey, let us lay aside some sin. There's some sin that you know about and you need to lay it aside. Anyone? Okay. Praise the Lord. How many of you are feeling like you just don't got the endurance anymore and you just want to, you don't know, you need more, more power. Okay? Praise God. And how many of you are committed today to run the race till the end, no matter what cost? Amen. Well, we're going to ask those who want to come forward that we're going to pray. If he's spoken to you about some of these things, 
Let us join together. Let us, the church, join together and deal with it. And today could be a new day where you run for Jesus. Amen? So I encourage you, there's the elders and leadership that's going to come up to pray. And we're going to pray that God, if something's entangling you, get set free from it. Something is sinful, deal with it. Amen? Or you just need a new boost from God. But most of all, let's run together. Let us do it together. In Jesus' name, God bless you. We get the prayer team to come forward. Join with us as we sing. Jesus conquered the grave. You're my Savior.